Very interesting building. It's got a slope of probably about 30 degrees, the, uh, which are hangar doors. And it has textured paint on it, but it's, it looks like sand. It's made to look like the side of the mountain that it's in, whether it's to disguise it from satellite photographs or what. This, this came from somewhere else. I mean, as bizarre as that is to believe, but I mean, it's there. I saw it. I know what the current state of the art is and in, in physics, and it's, it can't be done. This stuff is landing or crashing around the world, and unexpected countries have had this happen. Like, what the hell just crashed in Northern Italy? Uh, that is not ours, but let's look at it together. Imagine a world where the government possesses alien spaceships and even bodies from beyond the stars. That's the wild claim made by David Grush, a former intelligence officer with a serious resume. He served in the Air Force, worked for the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, and even the National Reconnaissance Office. Now he's saying the government has been hiding a decades-long operation to recover and study crashed UFOs and their pilots. How many crash retrieval incidents have there been? It is double digit. Uh, There's sp specific numbers I do know, however I can't discuss that. Grush says this program involves multiple government agencies and private companies, all working together in secret. They'd be recovering both intact alien vehicles and wreckage from crashes. If this is true, it means the government has had proof of extraterrestrial life for a long time, but has kept it all under wraps. It is a reverse engineering program to garner some kind of insight. Think about it, intact alien spacecraft. Imagine the technology they could hold. We could learn about advanced propulsion, material science, and way more than we even know exists. Even the wreckage would be a treasure trove of information about how these crafts work, and it gets even more interesting. Grash claims defense contractors are involved too. These companies often have the top-notch facilities and expertise needed to analyze and even try to understand how these alien technologies work. It all paints a picture of a joint effort between the military, intelligence agencies, and private companies, all working together to unlock the secrets of extraterrestrial technology. Pretty mind-blowing stuff, right? Okay, so we talked about the bombshell claims that the government might be hiding alien spaceships and even bodies from beyond the stars. But if all that technology is real, what would it mean for us mere Earthlings? Buckle up, because things are about to get even more mind-bending. Imagine spaceships that can cheat the speed of light or even bend gravity itself. That's the kind of stuff whistleblowers like David Grush are talking about. This could completely redefine space exploration, making it possible to visit distant galaxies in a fraction of the time it takes now. The possibilities for scientific discovery and understanding the universe would be mind-boggling. But it's not just spaceships. The materials used in these crafts could be unlike anything we've ever seen, potentially stronger, lighter, and even able to withstand the inferno of a star. This could revolutionize all sorts of industries, from building lighter and safer airplanes to creating next-generation medical equipment that could withstand extreme environments. Imagine the incredible advancements in fields like transportation, construction, and even everyday consumer goods. Then there's the whole energy question. If aliens have cracked the code on unknown energy sources, like harnessing the free energy from the universe itself, it could be a game changer. We could ditch fossil fuels and switch to clean, renewable energy sources practically overnight. This would not only have a profound impact on the environment, but could also usher in a new era of global cooperation and energy independence. Now, the idea of alien weapons is a bit scary. We wouldn't want any hostile forces getting their hands on super-powered ray guns, right? But there's another side to the coin. If we had advanced defensive technology, it could actually deter potential aggressors and promote peace through superior defensive capabilities. Imagine a world where the threat of large-scale conflict is significantly reduced because no one wants to mess with a civilization wielding unimaginable technology. So, whether these claims are true or not, one thing's for sure. The potential implications are staggering. They could rewrite the course of human history in ways we can't even begin to imagine. It could usher in a new era of scientific discovery, technological advancement, and even global peace. But it's important to remember that these are just hypothetical scenarios based on unconfirmed claims. However, 
they do serve as a thought-provoking reminder of the vast potential that lies beyond our current understanding of the universe. We delved into the claims of whistleblowers like Bob Lazar and David Grush, who allege the government is hiding alien spaceships and technology. Now let's zoom in on Lazar's specific story, which is filled with mind-bending ideas and controversy. I did get a chance uh, to look inside the craft on only one occasion. And this was important because where the reactor sat might have been critical to how it operated. One of Lazar's central claims is gravity wave propulsion, a concept suggesting these alien spacecraft could manipulate the fabric of space and time itself for movement. Imagine them creating a bubble of warped space, allowing them to travel at phenomenal speeds, perhaps even exceeding the speed of light. Lazar went a step further, elaborating on how this propulsion system supposedly works. He introduced a special element, element 115, which he claimed was the key ingredient. According to him, this element, when stimulated with protons, could generate an incredibly strong gravitational field that could then be harnessed for propulsion. It also allegedly functioned as a limitless energy source for the entire spacecraft. Now here's where things get complicated. Scientists haven't found any evidence to support Lazar's claims. The element he described, element 115, actually exists and is now called Moscovium. But it bears no resemblance to what Lazar described. Real Moscovium is highly unstable and wouldn't be capable of the feats Lazar attributed to element 115. Adding to the skepticism, scientists have pointed out inconsistencies between Lazar's explanations and established principles of physics and materials science. Additionally, the absence of publicly available proof or demonstrable prototypes of the technology fuels further doubt. Another significant aspect of Lazar's story is the alleged government cover-up. He claims the government went to extraordinary lengths to conceal this extraterrestrial technology from implementing stringent security clearances to supposedly harassing him after he went public. While some individuals believe him, others point to discrepancies in his background that raise questions about his credibility. So where do we stand? The truth is, we simply don't know. While Lazar's claims are undoubtedly intriguing, the lack of scientific evidence leaves them shrouded in mystery. Decades apart, two names have emerged, Bob Lazar and David Grush, and their stories share some striking similarities that raise some mind-boggling questions. Let's rewind to the 1980s. Bob Lazar bursts onto the scene, claiming he wasn't just tinkering with gadgets in his garage, he was reverse engineering alien spacecraft at a secret facility near Area 51. You used to work at Area 51. Well, you know, we Careful. want to be accurate. Okay. Area S4. S4, okay. It's about 15 miles south of Area 51. According to Lazar, these spacecraft defied the laws of physics as we know them, using anti-gravity propulsion fueled by an element unknown to science, which he called Element 115. Fast forward to the present day, and we have David Grush, a former intelligence officer with a distinguished military background, making waves with his own set of extraordinary claims. Grush alleges that the US government, through various agencies and in collaboration with defense contractors, has been actively involved in the retrieval and analysis of crashed extraterrestrial vehicles and even biological remains. These crafts, he says, possess technology and materials far surpassing anything humanity has ever seen. If these claims were true, the implications would be nothing short of mind-blowing. It wouldn't just confirm the existence of extraterrestrial life, but also suggest that we've been secretly studying their incredibly advanced technology for decades. Imagine spaceships defying gravity, materials stronger than diamond, and who knows what other scientific breakthroughs waiting to be unlocked. Both Lazar and Grouch paint a picture of a government working tirelessly to keep this information under wraps. They describe a web of secrecy, with stringent security measures, compartmentalized information, and alleged attempts to silence anyone who dares to speak up. Their reasoning, national security concerns, and the desire to maintain a technological edge over other countries. Now it's important to acknowledge that these are extraordinary claims, and extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Lazar's story, while captivating, has been met with skepticism, due to the lack of verifiable evidence and inconsistencies in his background. However, he has remained a central figure in UFO enthusiast circles, inspiring countless documentaries and discussions. 
Grouch, on the other hand, comes with a background in intelligence and the military, which might lend his claims a different level of credibility. However, like Lazar, he faces challenges in providing concrete evidence that can be publicly verified. So what does it all mean? As of now, the truth remains shrouded in mystery. These are just stories, and until something concrete emerges, they'll likely continue to be debated and dissected by believers and skeptics alike. But one thing's for sure, they spark our imaginations and leave us pondering the vast unknown that lies beyond our planet. After all, the universe is a fascinating place, and who knows what secrets it might still hold. Did you knowingly lie when you said you had actually seen anti-gravity propulsion in operation? I mean, it's the, the, to be on that cutting edge of technology is so alluring to me. Bob Lazar's tale reads like a page ripped from a science fiction novel, yet it's a narrative he's presented as his own real-life experience, captivating those intrigued by the mysteries of ufology for years. Imagine a young scientist, previously working on a classified particle accelerator project at Los Alamos National Laboratory, catching the eye of military contractors. This isn't the plot of a movie. It's how Lazar describes the beginning of his journey into the depths of one of the most secretive projects related to extraterrestrial technology. I did get a chance uh, to look inside the craft on only one occasion, and this was important because um, where the reactor sat might have been critical to how it operated. Lazar claims he was whisked away to work at a site known as S4, a place so shrouded in mystery, it could easily be mistaken for a mirage in the Nevada desert, just a stone's throw from the infamous Area 51. You used to work at Area 51. Well, you know, we Careful. want to be accurate. Okay. Area S4. S4, okay. It's about 15 miles south of Area 51. According to him, S4 was ingeniously camouflaged against the desert backdrop, designed to be invisible to the untrained eye and to keep prying eyes at bay. The security at S4, as Lazar recounts, was nothing short of what you'd expect for a facility rumored to house the secrets of the universe. Armed guards, surveillance cameras at every turn, and an advanced security system that could read the very bones in your hand. It was clear that whatever was being hidden here was of paramount importance. Lazar paints a picture of a work environment governed by the principle of need to know, where information was doled out sparingly, ensuring that the secrets of S4 remained just that, secrets. Did you ask any questions? About no, that? there's no asking there's questions. There's no asking questions. No. At the heart of Lazar's extraordinary claims are his alleged encounters with nine different extraterrestrial spacecraft, each with its own unique design and capabilities. Among these, the sport model stands out, a disc-shaped craft that seems to leap from the pages of a 1950s sci-fi magazine. There were three seats, they sat around uh, the Reactor was in the dead center of it, and then equidistant around there were three seats. So and that's all. He describes being part of a team tasked with reverse engineering the propulsion systems of these crafts, systems that defied all known laws of physics. Look, everyone doesn't necessarily start at a steam engine right. and go to an internal combustion engine and then, you know, electric power, nuclear power, and go up the ladder that we right. came on. Central to these propulsion systems, Lazar claims, was element 115, a substance not even recognized by science at the time of his disclosures, but later added to the periodic table as Moscovium. This element, according to Lazar, was the key to unlocking anti-gravity propulsion, allowing these crafts to perform maneuvers that would be impossible for any human-made machine. Lazar provides vivid descriptions of the craft's interiors, specifically the sport model which was equipped with a central reactor and three gravity amplifiers. These components, he says, could manipulate gravitational waves, allowing the craft to bend space-time and travel at unimaginable speeds. It's a concept that, if true, would revolutionize our understanding of travel and propulsion. In 1989, Lazar decided to bring his story to the public, sharing his experiences in interviews that would ignite a firestorm of debate and speculation. His claims were met with skepticism, as many questioned the veracity of his education, employment background, and the feasibility of the technologies he described. 
In 1989, Bob Lazar did something that would forever change the landscape of ufology and how the world views the secretive military base known as Area 51. What would you, how would you describe it? Uh, I, I guess within the Area 51 compound, you can call that a subset of Area 51. With a mixture of concern and a sense of duty, Lazar stepped into the spotlight on Las Vegas television, guided by investigative reporter George Knapp. He wasn't seeking fame. Instead, he was driven by a belief that the public had the right to know about the advanced technology he claimed was being concealed by the government. His revelations opened a Pandora's box, challenging us to question the boundaries of our knowledge and what mysteries the government might be keeping from us. However, Lazar's extraordinary tales were met with a healthy dose of skepticism. Critics were quick to point out the inconsistencies in his narrative, the apparent absence of evidence to back his claims, and the puzzling gaps in his academic and professional history. These controversies have swirled around Lazar, casting shadows of doubt on his credibility. Um, again, I forgot where the hell I am. Yet, despite the skepticism, Lazar's story has ignited a global conversation, thrusting Area 51 from the shadows of obscurity into the glaring light of public curiosity. Lazar's impact on the cultural zeitgeist cannot be understated, his allegations have fueled the imagination of millions, leading to an explosion of documentaries, books, and heated debates. Area 51, once just another top-secret military site, is now synonymous with alien technology and cover-ups, thanks in no small part to Lazar. His claims have kept the conversation about UFOs and the potential for alien contact alive, engaging a new generation of seekers and skeptics alike. The debate over Lazar's credibility continues to rage, with opinions sharply divided. Yet, regardless of where one stands on the issue, it's clear that his narrative has significantly shaped the discourse on extraterrestrial technology and government transparency. Bob Lazar's tales of his time working on alien spacecraft give us a peek into what sounds like the set of a sci-fi movie, especially when he talks about the sport model UFO. Picture this a sleek, disc-shaped craft that seems to have leaped right out of the pages of a UFO conspiracy theory into reality. Lazar says this design isn't just for show, it's about aerodynamic efficiency. Imagine a vehicle that glides through space, air, and maybe even water with the greatest of ease, its disc shape cutting down on resistance and allowing it to zip in any direction it pleases. It's the ultimate in alien engineering, blending the iconic look we've all come to associate with flying saucers with practical design features that make interstellar travel a breeze. But let's get down to specifics. According to Lazar, the sport model isn't some behemoth mothership. What is the, the roughly the size of this thing? We came up with 52 feet in diameter. This compact size hints at a craft designed for nimbleness, perhaps used for quick trips across the cosmos rather than carrying loads of extraterrestrial passengers. And it's not just any old material making up the exterior of this UFO. There are no, first of all, everything is one color. It's like a dark pewter color. And there are no right angles anywhere. Lazar describes it as a smooth metallic surface, suggesting it's built to survive the harsh conditions of space travel. From withstanding the bombardment of cosmic radiation to shrugging off the impact of micrometeorites, this material, whatever it is, Sounds like it's pretty tough stuff. Lazar even hints that it might be some kind of unknown alloy or advanced metamaterial, specially chosen for its propulsion and stealth capabilities. Diving into Bob Lazar's account of the sport model UFO, he paints a picture of an alien craft that's as intriguing on the inside as it is on the outside. According to Lazar, this isn't just a flying disc. It's a marvel of extraterrestrial architecture cleverly divided into three levels, each with a distinct purpose. It's like the designers, whoever or whatever they might be, took a page out of human engineering books but then added a twist that's out of this world. Starting at the bottom, the lower level of the craft is where all the magic happens, so to speak. Here lies the heart of the UFO's propulsion system, equipped with three gravity amplifiers and their waveguides. These aren't your average engine parts. They're the components that supposedly allow the craft to bend gravity to its will, making it possible to zip across the cosmos with ease. The strategic placement of these amplifiers at the craft's base is a thoughtful touch, ensuring stability and a smooth distribution of gravitational energy. Moving up to the middle deck, we find the crew's quarters, 
Given the UFO's overall dimensions, space here is at a premium, designed for occupants a bit smaller than your average human. This level likely packs in the essentials for life support and day-to-day -day operations, although Lazar leaves us guessing on the specifics of how these systems cater to the needs of its non-human users. It's a compact, efficient layout that makes you wonder about the daily lives of its extraterrestrial crew. At the top, the craft features a control hub that sounds like something straight out of a science fiction saga. The navigation and control systems here are said to be unlike anything we're familiar with, possibly incorporating holographic displays or even direct neural connections for piloting the craft. It suggests a level of technology and user interface design that humanity can only dream of, tailored for beings with physical traits quite different from our own. Lazar also notes an astonishing detail about the UFO's construction. There are no visible seams, rivets, or any signs of how it was put together. It's as if the entire craft was manufactured in one piece, hinting at a process that could involve molecular-level precision or materials that self-assemble. The overall design, with its disk shape and thoughtful distribution of internal systems, speaks to a philosophy where adaptability and efficiency are paramount, ensuring the craft can handle whatever the universe throws its way. Central to his eye-opening claims is the propulsion system of these alien crafts, powered by something straight out of a sci-fi novel, Element 115, or Moscovium, as it's known today. Back when Lazar first shared his experiences, Moscovium was a mere hypothesis, absent from the periodic table and unfathomable to mainstream science. Yet according to him, this element was the key to unlocking gravity-defying travel across the cosmos. Lazar's description of using element 115 sounds like alchemy of the future. He talks about a stable isotope of this element, undiscovered and unproduced on Earth, that could harness immense energy through an antimatter reaction. We're talking about converting tiny amounts of material into vast amounts of power, enough to fuel the craft's journey through the stars. This process, according to Lazar, could generate gravitational fields, propelling the spacecraft in ways that defy our current understanding of physics. But how exactly does this craft move? Enter the gravity amplifiers. Lazar describes these as the linchpins of the spacecraft's navigation, capable of bending gravity to the craft's will. With three of these amplifiers on board, the craft could maneuver with unparalleled agility, hovering, taking off vertically and gliding in any direction as if the laws of motion were mere suggestions. This isn't just about speeding through space, it's about reshaping the fabric of reality to move from point A to point B. The implications of such technology are staggering, offering a glimpse into a mode of travel that could take us to the stars and beyond without breaking a sweat. Lazar's accounts, whether you choose to believe them or not, ignite the imagination and challenge us to consider the possibilities that might lie just beyond the edge of our current scientific understanding.